A hero's work is never done. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, you don't have to be a superhero to get ahead of the curve with your home and garden. In today's show, we're gonna focus on some super performers. These will make your life a lot easier and you'll find that these will be some of the best sidekicks you've ever had. You know, spinach is pretty amazing. It's full of all sorts of things like protein, fiber, and some bodybuilding compounds. And speaking of bodybuilding, what about Popeye? I'm Popeye the sweat whale of That guy had some arms on him, didn't he? Now you wouldn't know it to look at it, but a spinach leaf has a lot of vitamins in it as well, like A and C, and minerals such as iron. You know, in the 1930s, spinach producers credited Popeye, the cartoon, for a 33% increase in spinach consumption. How's that for marketing? Hey, when I was a kid, it made me want to eat spinach. I actually love the stuff, and boy, do I have a great recipe for you today. The name of it is spinach tomato pasta. We're gonna start with the sauce and we're gonna take about a tablespoon of olive oil, the bottom of the skillet, by the way, which is on medium heat, and just coating the entire bottom here, just using a wooden spoon. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one shallot, just slice it thinly. And we're gonna just cook this until it becomes clear. But uh, while that cooks, we're gonna add a fourth of a teaspoon of some red pepper flakes. So just give it a little punch. All right, so you can see here that we're just about ready for the next step, and that is to add the spinach. And what we're gonna use here is about five ounces of, or four cups of spinach. Just gonna put that fresh spinach in there like that. Of course, this cooks down, as you know. And then to this, we're going to add a fourth of a cup of low sodium chicken broth. Now you can see the spinach is all cooked down. We're ready for the next three ingredients. We're gonna use a fourth a cup of half and half. Let's equally distribute that. And then we're going to use some Romano cheese. And uh, what we have here is about a fourth of a cup and I'm gonna use about three quarters of this. We're gonna hold off with just a little bit to finish out the recipe. And then half a teaspoon of black pepper. All right, I'm gonna stir all this together. Oh, I wish you could smell this, it's mm, wonderful. Cheese is all melting nicely. This makes a great sauce. And you're gonna cook this, again, over medium heat for about three minutes. You wanna make sure that all of these flavors meld together. Okay, you can see it's thickened now and it's just about ready. So what we're gonna do is take this off the stove. Here, and I'm gonna turn this off. And now it's just a matter of assembling this with the other ingredients. What I have here is some whole wheat pasta. And what I've done is taken a 13 ounce bag, cooked it, which you end up with are about four cups of pasta. You can see I've used rotini pasta. You can use penne pasta, just your choice. All right, so this is cooled and it's ready now to add these final ingredients. What I have here is a full cup of Little grape tomatoes, one that we grow here that I love so much is one called Juliet. These have been sliced in half, so we're gonna add those. Look at that beautiful color. I'm gonna make sure that's all blended together. And I'm gonna add the sauce, the spinach. And you wanna distribute this evenly. Now this is enough pasta to serve four you can serve it at room temperature, or you can actually heat it up a bit. And now I'm gonna finish it off with just that bit of Romano cheese. We have that remaining fourth of cheese. And then you wanna add one tablespoon of fresh, chopped, flat leaf Italian parsley. Easiest herb in the world to grow. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? It's ready to serve. You can salt and pepper to taste.
After the break, the skinny on the often underappreciated super herb known as parsley. And later, chicken mansion. Stay with us as Garden Style continues. Parsley, one of the most popular herbs in the world. But did you know that parsley can be much more than just some decoration on your plate? As a relative to celery, parsley is a lush plant growing up to a foot tall. I love to grow parsley as companions to annuals, perennials, and other herbs in beds, containers, and window boxes. The fresh green foliage makes a nice seasonal edging and provides a striking contrast to colorful annuals. Whether it's curly parsley or it's flat leaf Italian cousin, both of these types of parsley contain compounds that deliver some real health benefits. Parsley's volatile oils, particularly meristocin, have been shown to inhibit tumor formation and qualifies it as a chemoprotective food that can help neutralize particular types of carcinogens. In addition to its volatile oils, parsley is an excellent source of vitamin A and one of the most important B vitamins, folic acid which we all know is good for your cardiovascular health. So why relegate parsley to a garnish? Get creative and make it your new best friend. I'm in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. It's well known for its gorgeous beaches, outstanding views, and lavish mansions where the idea of too much is just enough was followed to the nth degree. Now, one of the things that you may find interesting here, some of these mansions are not so well known. There's one tucked in the hills of Newport that really has a magical quality. And the dwellers of this estate, well, they play an important role in the preservation of heritage livestock. SVF Foundation, or Swiss Village Farm Foundation, was developed in the early 1900s as a working farm. Arthur Curtis James and his wife developed this property to house his prize-winning herd of Guernsey cattle. And it was a working farm until the 1940s. It changed hands several times, and it was purchased in 1998 by Mrs. Dorrance Hamilton, who is a philanthropist, and she's done a lot here in Newport. She wanted to preserve the property, and she collaborated with Tufts University to set up this nonprofit foundation which preserves endangered breeds of livestock. 
My name is Rocky Steves. I'm the resident manager here at SVF. I do a little bit of everything, but uh, one of the more fun things I get to do is uh, work in the garden and uh, play with the chickens. You know, when you think about the way these, these birds live out here on this property, I mean, they're in uh, what would be considered an estate among the uh, animal kingdom for sure. The buildings in this part of the village all have steam-bent cedar shingles that were constructed to emulate thatched roofs as you'd see in Europe back in the 1800s. And we raised the roof up a bit to make it easier for folks to walk around in there and uh, see the birds. And it also has given the birds um, you know, much bigger space than they might be used to if, say, it was in a more commercial area. We also, inside the buildings, went with what would be considered period lighting of the day, kind of uh, you know, the enamel stuff and then the uh, what we call the jelly jars, give the birds enough light during the day and the uh, darker months. Chickens are a great way for people to see what the difference is of breeds within a species and kind of helps a little bit of understanding heritage breeds that we're trying to preserve. When Garden Style returns, we'll head to California to check out some super water-saving plants for your garden. Ted, there are concerns everywhere about water usage these days. You seeing that in, in, the, in the nursery business, people looking more and more for plants that are not quite so thirsty? Sure, absolutely, <laughs> Alan. In California in particular, there's just, uh, there's just no rain. We haven't had any rainfall, yeah, no water. I know, so I've more and more news. people are looking towards uh, draw tolerant material for their yards and landscaping. Well, you don't really have to give up on beauty if, uh, to, to take some of these drought tolerant plants into your garden. No, absolutely not. I'm, for example, uh, Lantana here. Gosh, look at that color. And, and Festuca. And if you compare the, the two types of plants, they're so different in their structure and color. Yeah. And, look at the um, texture. Texture. Yeah. Exactly. So, so this is oh. the sea urchin uh, fescue. Correct. Yeah. yeah that, is, that is just gorgeous. Absolutely. And then there are the, the sedums, uh, so many of these succulents, I guess I should say, in that whole category. Those sure. That, that actually hold water in their in their tissue. Exactly. And there we're seeing that being used more and more uh, mm -hmm. in the landscape and uh, agave certainly. Oh, agaves. Uh, they're so uh, architectural. And they come in so many different shapes and sizes. So Ted, mm -hmm. if someone's looking for some bloomers, uh, sure. really into flowers. What are some good examples of drought tolerant plants that you find are popular here? Uh, gazania for certain is, is really popular. The trailing yellow, you yeah. see it along a lot of freeways and oh, the interstates, yeah. right, along with right. the purple antenna. That purple antenna family. is amazing. And it is a great plant. Yeah. It is. It will grow almost anywhere with... It uses so little water. So little water, it blooms so profusely. And you know, Ted, when you're thinking about these drought tolerant plants, if you think of areas of the world that are dry, often the plants that come from there are going to be suitable to the conditions that we have today with little water like the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean so many herbs exactly come from there. Perfect. The obvious choice being rosemary, I suppose at the top of the list. Lavender. Lavender. Right. Um, uh, we even use oregano. I've got oregano in my uh, cactus garden, believe it or not. Yeah. It's a garden is an ornamental. It doesn't take any water. These are all great super savers, yeah, I guess we could call super them. super savers, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Perfect. Yes. After the break, these super duper flowers are big, bold, and beautiful in your garden or in your home. What if I told you there was a family of plants that make great cut flowers that you can use in the house, they're easy to grow, you can have a succession of blooms so you can cut anytime you want, well, within season and within reason, and that this plant comes back year after year. It's perennial. Well, that would be these lilies. I love the fact that these blooms are bicolored. They have a, a deep, rich, sort of orange, almost red center 
that gives way to a lovely apricot at the edge, and then the little speckles, well, they add a lot as well. I love to arrange these quite simply with another flower form, like a hydrangea. It's white and creamy and has a completely different flower form, a big round ball-shaped flower contrasted with this. It's dynamite. Now come on over here. I want to show you a bed that's finishing up. Just take a look at these. These bloomed earlier. Now when you're thinking about lilies, think about this. What I have first are my Asiatics. They bloom first and they're finishing up here. Then come the LA hybrids. I just showed you one of those, first crown. And then the next are the Oriental hybrids to bloom. So you get this succession of bloom, early, mid, and late, which is great. Now, after they bloom, you see I didn't cut these for flower arranging. That is a seed head right there. What you wanna do is just cut off your lilies like this and just discard the seed head. And what happens is you wanna leave this foliage and bolster that bulb under there for next year's bloom. So that's the great thing about these lilies is they come back year after year. Now when you plant them, you wanna make sure you give them plenty of sun. They like full sun and the soil must drain well. Otherwise the bulbs will rot. So I just wanted to give you an example of lilies in a garden setting. Earlier I was showing you how I had them in rows for cutting for using in the house. But here they're part of the landscape. Here's first crown in bloom with this backdrop of nine bark, which is very beautiful. And if you'll look here below, this is the first wave of Asiatics that have already flowered. And I, what I need to do today is take off the seed heads just as I showed you before, and I will leave the foliage. And next year, this display will come back. By the way, this variety down here is called Orange Pixie, and it bloomed about two weeks before these started flowering. So that's what I love in the garden, is that succession of color blocking, bold, bright bloom. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for more recipes, garden tips, and blog posts. Stop on by and stay a while. We'll be back right after the break. You know, I think it's safe to say that the idea of super can take many forms. Power foods, easier ways to take care of your garden. These everyday heroes can have a big impact on your routine. So whether you choose to don a cape or keep it subtle, take the time to make your life a little more super by improving the environment around you. You might be surprised by the results.